legionnaires, members of the 8,000 strong French Foreign Legion, arguably one of the most famous fighting machines in the world. These men, like the SAS and the American Greenberries, are tough, highly trained international troubleshooters, professional gunmen in search of a war. For many, the romantic image of the Legion, fostered principally by the author P.C. Wren in his classic novel, Beaugest, is of a soldier trekking through the scorching deserts of North Africa. The reality today is that the Legion's dusty Saharan forts have been exchanged for modern garrisons in sleepy provincial towns in southern France. The Legionnaire always appears as a mystical figure, yet it is this mystique which still attracts 1,500 men a year into the Legion and which produces a team spirit probably unmatched by any other army in the world. I joined the Foreign Legion at the beginning of 1960. I signed on in Paris for the standard minimum five years, and after a couple of days or so, they brought us down here to Fort Saint-Nicolas in Marseille. In those days, all Legion recruits were brought here for a period of Legion acclimatization to get the feel of it before being shipped across to Algeria. And there's no question about it, in this place you certainly get the feel of it. The scene in this courtyard was reminiscent of those old black and white prison films we used to see. There were guys standing around in small groups, they had shaven heads, wore the most disreputable, dirty old denims, and they looked pretty furtive. In no sense at all was there a welcome of any sort. Feeling was cool, unfriendly, and really quite sinister. Every Tuesday afternoon, a van draws into the gates of the Legion headquarters near Marseille, bringing another group of prospective Legionnaires claiming to be any age between 18 and 40. Many of them will already have traveled perhaps thousands of miles to one of the Foreign Legion's 25 enlistment centers in France before being brought here for final selection. Only one in four will make it through the rigorous physical and psychological tests. Every legionnaire has the option of signing up under a false name. He doesn't have to. I didn't. The foreign legions say that a legionnaire can enjoy complete protection from anything from which he may be hiding, provided that he takes the necessary precautions to preserve his anonymity, as this poster in the recruits' barracks explains. Basically, if there is anyone after you, and uh, they, they, they want you, and there's a chance that there's going to be someone <coughs> knocking on the door for you, uh, they want to be forewarned, because, as I say, forewarned is forearmed, and they'll protect you. The, anonym the anonymity is paramount. <coughs> that, that, that is fact. They won't give you up. All new recruits are referred to as engagés volontaires, voluntary recruits. So the Legion is sensitive to accusations that Legionnaires are press-ganged into joining up. They are all volunteers. These are the barracks in which I spent my first few days on arrival in Marseille. They are no longer used. All that remains is perhaps the ghosts of those thousands of Legionnaires who must have passed through here on their way to North Africa. When I was here 20 odd years ago, there were about 150 of us jammed in these rooms. The bunks were four high and there was the width of a man's body between them. It was a, it was a veritable concentration camp. The atmosphere in the evenings was amazing. There were long tables down here. There was the endless chatter of all these different nationalities, the endless movement, poker games going on and so on. By the time we'd been here 10 days, two weeks, we would have done anything to get out of here. We would have gone anywhere. And finally, the great day came, and they told us we would be sailing in the morning on the SS City Belabès to Algeria. From 1848 until the French pulled out of Algeria in 1962, this, the Cartier Vienno in City Belabès, was the nerve center of the Foreign Legion. But now, the same Cartier Vienno has been transferred to this sleek headquarters of the Legion in Aubagne home of the somber monument to the dead, commemorating the death in battle of 30,000 legionnaires. The legion was formed in 1831, at a time of political unrest in Europe, by King Louis Philippe of France, 
who declared that there shall be formed a legion consisting of foreigners. This legion shall assume the title of Foreign Legion. At that time, it was divided into separate units of Germans, Spaniards, Italians, Belgians, and Poles. And wherever France had an unpleasant fighting job to do, these ruffians were sent to Algeria, Morocco, the Sahara, Dahomey, Senegal, the Sudan, the Dardanelles, and Indochina. And it was in the deserts of North Africa that the Legion tradition of no surrender began. The Legion has always been a respected fighting force, but like Caesar's Roman legions before them, they are also great builders. The Legion were particularly effective in colonizing North Africa for the French, because they were able to cover enormous distances on foot. Then they would build a fort, pacify the areas around it, leave a garrison, and move on and build another fort. This network of Legion roads and forts can still be found all over North Africa today. This newsreel film of the Legion's participation in the defense of Bir Hakim against Rommel's tanks in the Western Desert in 1942 aptly demonstrates the popular image of the Foreign Legion, blazing sun, sand and desert. And filmmakers for decades have depicted Legionnaires fighting against appallingly overwhelming odds in North Africa, while still apparently finding time to have a little romance on the side. Sadly for the romantics, the camels and horses have all gone, and in their place, the Legion has been equipped with some of Europe's most advanced military hardware. Je volunteer, Alla, Abazot, mon chef. Repo allez, avance ici. After a fortnight or so of acclimatization at Herbine near Marseille, those selected as legionnaires after interrogation are required to sign a contract binding them to the Foreign Legion for five years. The contract emphasizes that they sign of their own free will. The contract also states that they can regain their original nationality and identity only after completion of three years' service in the ranks. A few days ago, you were probably sitting in a pub somewhere drinking beer, the day you were in the Foreign Legion. How did you come to be here? Well, I've been thinking about it for a year because I met some guy who was in the Legion and he told me about it. I'd always have the, pre the impression that everyone's got the impression that it's, it's a real bunch of thugs. You know, if you want to come and get your throat cut, come to the Legion kind of thing. But he, he changed my idea and I've been dissatisfied with my life in England. Anyway, you know, every, everywhere, you know, the brakes went against you, usually, and, unless you're face fitted. And mine usually didn't. So I joined to forget, like all the, all the others who joined, they joined to forget. I was working uh, with my father in his fish and chip shop in Cheltenham there. I had uh, family problems, I was really pissed off. The marriage was on the rocks. And I had a, uh, two of my uncles uh, had previously committed, uh, a d died really, and died. And, um, and I always wanted to, I'd always wanted to join. Well, um, the reason seems both rather funny and rather frivolous. It was to do with a girl. Can I leave it at that? Well, my wife had left me, and one Sunday morning, the parents were looking at the news of the world in the Sunday Mirror, and there was something about a legionnaire that was too young, and his mother and father wanted to get him out. And the Monday morning, I got a train, uh, I got the plane for Paris, and I joined the legion straight away. Refugees, revolutionaries, princes, poets, musicians, adventurers, Yes, and even criminals 
have all been welcomed by the Legion. This, for instance, is Giuseppe Battai. He was the Minister of Education and Culture under Mussolini. At the end of the war, he was condemned to death, he escaped, and took refuge in the Legion from 1944 to 1951. Cole Porter, the American songwriter, who wrote such memorable songs as I've Got You Under My Skin, he was also in the Legion. This is the contract which he signed when he joined the Legion. And over here is the official poet of the Legion, an American, Alan Seeger. Here are a few lines from perhaps his best known poem. But I've a rendezvous with death at midnight in some flaming town when spring trips north again this year. And I, to my pledged word, am true. I shall not fail that rendezvous. Legionnaires spend four months basic training near Toulouse, where the emphasis is on discipline and physical fitness. The new legionnaire is indoctrinated with the philosophy that having lost his roots, he is now ready to give his all, sacrificing everything and even his life if required. So says the Foreign Legion recruiting pamphlet. The training, the, the new recruit, is not, it's not the same as uh, when me and Michael joined up. Eh? We joined about between eight and ten years ago. He was here in Corsica, now he's in France. There's a difference between the boys that join up now and us, if you like. There's a generation gap to start with. When they finish their four months there, they come here. We, we finish the training. We give them a quick in the arse. A few of them need straightening out. We have to treat them rough, because one, one day they've got to go. Maybe a cold or a place like that. They've got to be able to take punishment. The only way is to kick them about a bit. Commitment to the Legion for these new recruits must be total. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Life is almost monastic. No visits into town, no telephone calls home, and lights out at 10.30. Legionnaire Walker, Cap Martyr's Service, Premier Company, Session to the of Zor Sergeant! Walker, why isn't the Parker rolled like the others? When you put your Parker in, it has to be rolled smaller, round. Stephen Belusky was one Legionnaire who found this regimentation impossible to bear. You're always scared. You'd, you know, I've got an inspection at Sean, you're on parade, you're always scared if it's you next, if there's something wrong with you. You know, you're always worried what the next punishment going to be if you made a mistake. So, you know, it weighs down on you after a bit. Legionnaire Knudsen, Katmar Savez, Premier Company, Sixteen Leutnant Figuet, Avisar Sushan. Knudsen, Le Fourchette et Le Queer Sava. Le Couteau, no. Oui, les autres, ils n'ont pas que tôt. Toi, tu n'as pas que tôt. Okay. Ah, bon, ça, ça. You understand what I've said? Oui, c'est ça. Combien il y en a 22. 22, complet. I'd say it's, it's no tougher than the Royal Marines or the, the Paris in the British Army. It's, it's a professional army. Uh, any professional army has to be tougher than a, an army of national servicemen. Surely, so. But being the, the toughest in the world, I, I wouldn't know about that. The discipline's harsh, and if you make a mistake, they're on you like a ton of bricks. You know, like you come on parade and you, they check your collar on your back of your shirt. If it's dirty, you're in trouble. Or you might have a double crease, because you've three stripes here. you three at the back and three across, and you have tying them in every time on your shirt. If not right, I forget the exact measurement there. But if they're wrong, you know, you're not going to punch your stomach, punch right head. But this is always done when there's not an officer there. Oh, no, there's no thuggery involved at all nowadays. Uh, sometimes when a chappie has to... There's certain people which have to be taught a lesson the hard way. 
And I'm not saying that uh, there's nothing to read between the lines. But uh, you can't always say to a chap, well, I prefer you did it this way. Sometimes you have to shout, but it's the same in school. The teacher does it. I've been kicked around, yeah. But when I've been kicked around, I've earned it. You understand? If, the, if, if uh, my ship the section, he says, what do you want? Eight days jail, or you want a smack in the face, like, you know? I said, well, give me the smack in the face. And we, they, you can't go out for eight days, look, because you got a smack in the face. That was correct. That was uh, nothing marked on your card, nothing like that. I mean, that was good. There was brutality, but uh, not now, not now. Uh, now, uh, the non-commissioned officers are very closely watched, very closely watched. Uh, and if, if it's found that they harm a legionnaire in any way or other, even mentally or physically, they, they, they won't stay non-commissioned officers for long. But just how tough is the discipline in the Foreign Legion? Like many other things, it's difficult to find where myth ends and reality begins. Visibly, the Legion looks tough, but no more so than some other armies. However, what goes on behind the scenes is perhaps more telling. This guy deserted. Three, four days later, they got him. He tied you know, his arms together at the back of the cheek, made him run. And when he got tired, he dragged him along the floor for a couple hundred yards. There was a bit of rational you know, cuts and things like that. Well, the only thing I can say there is that he's got a very live imagination. If an officer had have dragged uh, a legionnaire behind a jeep, he would have been thrown out of the Legion and out of the French army, straight away, without, without any questions asked. He would have been thrown out straight away. Recently, three Legionnaires made an unprecedented appearance on television, during which they complained about the discipline and punishments, which they claimed were barbaric and out of context with this day and age. We have been told by the Legion that this is a political issue, and not what it appears to be on the surface and that the three legionnaires were encouraged to do this by left-wing elements. This may well be so. But again, on another occasion, we were approached surreptitiously by a legionnaire who gave us this letter, in which he complains of ill-treatment, and he's begging us to help him get out. In the old days in Algeria, there were no witnesses. Today, it's different. The legion has been threatened that it will be disbanded if it doesn't conform by the present socialist government. So the word is low profile, no incidents, and no scandals. Unemployment is perhaps one of the principal reasons for joining the Legion today, though salaries initially are not high, around 150 pounds a month. There are some 500 British volunteers in the Legion, and though the Legion is ostensibly for foreigners, more than half the total force today are actually of French descent. The Legion's ranks have traditionally been fueled by global events. Hungarians from the uprising in 1956, Czechs from the revolution in 1968, and in the last year alone, Polish volunteers have dramatically increased. And at the last count, Legionnaires came from 99 different countries and they're all welded together into one legion by one single factor, language, French. Qu'est-ce que c'est? C'est une pelle. Qu'est-ce que c'est? C'est une pelle. Qu'est-ce que c'est? C'est une branche. Qu'est-ce que c'est? C'est une branche. Le caillou. Le caillou. Le caillou, le caillou. La racine. La racine. La racine. La racine. La pelle. La pelle. La pelle. La pelle. Al. Qu'est-ce que c'est? C'est de la terre. Qu'est-ce que c'est? C'est une racine. Al caillou. Al caillou, pardon. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Qu'est-ce que c'est une racine? Qu'est-ce que c'est? C'est une pelle. Qu'est-ce que c'est? C'est la branche. Assis. 
Baisse. Qu'est-ce que c'est Ça, là, de terre. De la terre De la terre. Qu'est-ce que c'est Ça, la racine. Qu'est-ce que c'est Ça, la caillou. Le caillou. Le caillou. Qu'est-ce que c'est Ça, la pelle. Qu'est-ce que c'est Ça, la branche. Je ne regrette rien. Edith Piaf's most famous song was dedicated to the Foreign Legion. And in basic training, great emphasis is laid on singing and the learning of the regimental songs, which include everything from opera to songs of Legion defeats. Contre le Viet, for instance, against the Viet Minh in Indochina. And it is this singing whilst marching at the Legion's slow, somber pace of 88 steps to the minute that is one of the prime factors in building this unique Legion spirit. The real source of this unique spirit, which binds all these legionnaires together, lies in an obscure campaign in Mexico, nearly 120 years ago, when 63 legionnaires fought virtually to the last man against 2,000 Mexicans at a place called Camarón. And in this glass case up here is the actual wooden hand of Captain Donjou, who commanded this little band of legionnaires. His hand was found in the ashes after the battle. When the Foreign Legion first arrived in Mexico, they were being used to escort convoys of gold bullion into the interior to pay for the troops. At dawn on April the 30th, 1863, a convoy of 63 Legionnaires were attacked by about 2,000 Mexicans. The Legionnaires were under the command of the experienced Capitaine Donjou, who'd lost his left hand while serving in the Crimea and who now wore a wooden one in its place. They fought their way to a farmhouse called Camarón, and for the rest of the day, without food or water, they fought off the 2,000 Mexicans. Capitaine Donjou was mortally wounded, but just before dying, made the legionnaires swear to fight to the death. And at the end, there were five left standing, the others either dead or wounded. And the five fired their last cartridges, fixed bayonets and charged out of the farmhouse into the Mexican troops. And by some miracle, the Mexican commander managed to stave off the ultimate massacre and three legionnaires survived. It was a defeat, but to the legion, it epitomizes the spirit which is invested in each and every one of them to fight to the last man. And on April the 30th every year, in every corner of the world where the Legion are stationed, they have a tremendous celebration, and they relive in their minds that long, hot day in Mexico, when 63 of them fought off 2,000 Mexicans. the Legion's most famous battles can really only be considered as defeats. In 1954, for instance, the bloodbath of Dien Bien Phu ended the French occupation of Indochina. Sergeant Valdemar Neumerkel was one of the few to survive the carnage that resulted. Très légèrement, c'était pas grand chose, mais jour à jour, ça vient plus dur. Well, there was very little action at first, but it grew more intense with every day that passed. 
At the end, we were completely surrounded. We had no more ammunition, virtually nothing left to eat. And the Viet Minh broke through at 5 p.m. on May the 7th. That was the end for everyone. It was terrible. There were more than 10,000 dead and wounded. Some of the wounded were still manning the machine guns, some of whom had had their feet blown off. The Vietnamese wanted us to surrender, and we did not. Everyone was saying, here we are, it's going to be Cameroon all over again. And that's what happened. Nobody surrendered. This is the Ceremonie de Remise de Képi Blanc, the night when, after completing basic training, the Legionnaire is finally considered worthy of his white képi. The setting at night is designed to have a strong emotive effect on the Legionnaires, but the practical benefit for them is that, armed with their white képis, they are now allowed for the first time to go into town. Le képi blanc que vous venez de coiffer symbolise votre appartenance à la Légion étrangère. Cette grande famille forte de 8000 légionnaires répartis aux quatre coins du monde. vehemently sang of living and fighting in pain whilst trampling through the mud. But for Stephen Belusky, the Legion's military machismo became just too much, and he deserted. I, I was ill. I was, I was doing 30 days in a guardhouse. And I, I caught a Spanish, what did you call it, Spaniards? It's like a white mosquito, and it lays eggs into your skin, and they eat on your flesh. And I got it fairly bad. I had 36 impacts, what they call impacts. And I was going to, every day into hospital, you know, for injections, and then uh, I received shock off an injection, like off penicillin, and I had an heart attack. And after, an hour after, I got stuck back in the nick again. And I just had enough then of messing, being messed about. When I come out at nick, I waited a couple of weeks. And I knew this bloke, he had a, you know, a flat knee regiment. I broke into his house, and it's a gun and ammunition, and set off down to St. Lawrence, that's a frontier into Suriname. I was there, for, I was not run for five days, six days. I was in a bar in St. Lawrence, and two PMs got me. One had a revolver, one had a, revo you know, a rifle. She said, if you move, I'll blow your head off. They said where they'd gone, it was under the table in the back. I got touched at Gendarmerie, at St. Lawrence, stayed overnight, got beat up in the cells, and got took back to the regiment. Some people that join that don't really know what they're getting into, and suddenly wake up one day and find out that uh, it's not the sort of job for them. And they made a mistake and haven't got the sort of moral courage to stand up and say, uh, right, well, I made a mistake, but I've given my parole, so I should stay five years. I did 30 days, you know, solitary. I was on for about 10 days on bed and water, something like that. After that, I, when I sort of passed Colonel, as I said, next time, if you don't let me go, it's the next time, if I have to kill somebody, I'll get out. Well, uh, really, myself, uh, I deserve a... Uh, he's a letdown. He's, he's nothing. He's nothing. Who do you want to desert for? I mean, it's the thing that you you give your word. You just broke your word, didn't you? You promised them, and you broke your promise. What is the promise? Well, you promised to serve for five years, and you broke that promise. And they went to all this kind of trouble to get you into the Legion, all the paperwork done, everything done fed you, clothed you, and paid you. And, and, uh, and you came in with nothing. And you broke your promise. It's difficult to say why they can't adapt to the situation. 
I don't really know myself. We get all sorts, and I think there's many, many reasons. I did, in fact, have a friend who spent two and a half years here. But in the end, he decided it wasn't his, his idea of how he wanted to live. And he went back to Britain, and at this moment, I've had a letter from him. He's studying medicine at uh, Cambridge University. I deserted because uh, I had served for about half my contract, and I hadn't had any leave. Leave is fairly limited, but for one trivial reason or another, I hadn't had any leave. A second, and perhaps more irritating point, was that I was being sent to Djibouti, and I'd been to Djibouti previously with my own company from the Parachute Regiment, and I hadn't liked the climate. I'd gained a lot of weight. As I was very keen not to go to Djibouti, wanted some leave, I left Marseille to go to Paris for a few days, decided that I may just as well go home, and so I came back to England. He will, of course, have a problem if he ever wants to come back to France, because, in fact, the Legion and the French authorities look for Legion deserters for, I believe, 27 or 28 years after the date of their desertion. I am concerned about the consequences, but at the moment I think it's more important that I should get on with working in England than worrying about what the Foreign Legion are thinking about me. I don't think it's impossible that I should go back but at the moment, I'm trying to get on with some fairly mundane things. The day after this interview took place, Matthew Henson left for France to give himself up and rejoin the Legion. And about 200 Legionnaires still desert every year. For the first few years of a Legionnaire's career, the opportunities for leave are either extremely limited or non-existent. And social life is not part of the training syllabus. Though the Legion is prepared to relax on certain festive occasions, such as this one after the annual Cameroon celebration. Holiday homes, such as this one at Malmousk on the Mediterranean, are provided for Legionnaires returning from arduous postings abroad. And it is only abroad that the Legion acknowledges that Legionnaires might occasionally need female company by providing carefully controlled Legion bordellos. Lola worked for the Legion for 34 years. I'll tell it my way, okay? My way. The Legion found me in Algeria when they came back from Indochina. I had no family. It was the Legionnaires who brought me up. They gave me bread. I had nothing to eat. I was utterly destitute. I had no family left. I had no one. They brought me up. I still work with them, and I'll die with them. I'll stay with them my whole life. I love them very much. And that's it. Calvi in Corsica is the home of the 2nd Legion Parachute Regiment, or the REP. There used to be three parachute regiments. The first was axed in 1961 after the failure of the General's Rebellion against de Gaulle, and the third was wiped out in Indochina. That left the solitary parachute regiment, the REP, in which I served for five years in Algeria. An aperitif is taken before lunch by officers of the Rep in the citadel of Calvi. Only a few legionnaires become officers, but the ladder may take them 20 years to climb. The majority of the Rep's officers are Saint-Cyr trained, the French equivalent of Sandhurst or West Point, and only the cream are posted to the Legion.
Rep prides itself on being one of the most highly trained parachute regiments in the world. And it's this training that enables them to jump in very tight formation at low altitude. Above me, right now, 30 legionnaires have just cleared that aeroplane in less than nine seconds. So the rep's role is that of an intervention force, a group of go-anywhere, do-anything airborne action men, ready at 24 hours' notice to safeguard what's left of France's colonial empire in South America, Africa, the Indian Ocean, and the South Pacific. of the rep are paratroopers, yes, but each one of them must also be a specialist. They are alpinists, frogmen, explosive experts, or whatever. They must learn to fight in the mountains, and they must understand fighting in the streets. And their brand of fighting is very much in demand today, as we have seen recently in many different parts of the world. Kulwezi in Zaire was a prime example of the rep's role of rapid international airborne troubleshooters. In May 1978, 4,000 Katangese rebels rampaged through the town, massacring French and Belgian civilians. And you looked out this small uh, porthole, you start to see the smoke coming up, and you thought, Christ, this is for real, like, you know. 
and uh, green light went, and out we went. The big thought with me was, uh, Christ, I hope I get out with a parachute quick enough, I don't want anybody to shoot me in my parachute. Like. Anyway, the main impression when I hit the ground was there's clash of goals on the right, bursting away there, and one of our own machine guns on the left there. And uh, I was thinking, Christ, I hope uh, there's nobody can see me before I see them. Like. Yeah. Basically, when we went into the town, we regrouped. The main thing that hit me was the smell of uh, bodies. There were bodies all over the place. Just like one of those done-up war films, like, only, you know, this time it was reality. And the thing that I always remember about uh, Kowizzi, well, one of the first uh, guys that was killed on that operation, there was only five altogether. The first one was an Englishman, a guy called uh, Arnold. Before we embarked on the planes, was, uh, he says, uh, well, Mark, we're going now. It's a pity we're not on the same plane, but uh, at least uh, if we do go, this, will be, this is a good way to go. It just so happened he was the first guy to get killed. And he was an Englishman. To me, it, was, it made it quite an impression. But I was, I was still proud to be part of the operation. It was worth it, because uh, we did save a couple of thousand uh, Europeans that otherwise might have been massacred uh, by a bunch of... Uh, guerrillas and God knows what else. So it, was, it did do something. Around 200 civilians were massacred and 400 guerrillas and five legionnaires lost their lives at Kulwesi. If you ask a legionnaire his nationality, he might well say, the legion is my country, legio patria nostra. And the fact that they are serving France and being paid by France is incidental. Would there be a conflict, therefore, if a legionnaire was asked to fight against his own country? Lieutenant Colonel Senye of the Rep. If you tell a legionnaire that he's going to fight in such and such a place, he won't argue. He'll go and fight where he's told. Legionnaires were told, for example, to go and fight in Kolwezi. They had nothing against the people of Zaire, nothing against the invaders either. They were simply told to go, and they went. And the Rep have recently been seen in Beirut, as part of the multinational peacekeeping force sent in after the Shaba Shatila massacre of September 1982. Not all Corsicans are in favor of the Legion remaining on the island. A minority group of nationalists seeking self-government have demanded that the Legion should leave. These initials, E. Francesi Fora, clearly state French go home. The Legion, which first came here about 20 years ago, tried to establish itself with the help of certain elected representatives who tried to glorify the military exploits of the Legion, particularly in the colonial territories. But the people of Corsica, and us in particular, have rebelled against the presence of this force, whose recruitment makes it a mercenary force. We believe that the vast majority of the Corsican people would want the Legion to leave and be disbanded. We are mercenaries in one sense, because we fight for another country. Uh, and in another sense, we're not mercenaries, because we don't fight for money. Uh, in the real sense of the word mercenary, which means somebody who fights for money, we're not. Uh, I'm not a mercenary, professional soldier. I am working effectively for a foreign government, but I'm working in Europe the West, for the free, free country. And we are not at all mercenaries, as considered with uh, the Congo Bells mercenaries and such like, who were killers, in fact, who were paid, uh, had no, uh, no sort of scruple or anything, no morale. I like to think of us as professional soldiers, learning to do a good trade, a good profession from the, uh, for the West, free world. With no serious French military intervention since Kulwesi, Boredom is now perhaps the Legion's greatest enemy, and it's only training assaults of this kind that really provide the Legionnaire with any practical experience. My advice to anybody who's thinking about joining the Foreign Legion is first to remember what the Foreign Legion does. It's part of an army, it's run by the French, for their own ends, and it tends to be sent in to do dirty work and legionaries have a habit of being killed and they don't do a lot of retreating.
Bravo, mon colonel Je te remercie pour le travail que tu as accompli à la Légion. Tu peux être fier des 22 ans de service que tu as accompli parmi nous. Bravo, mon colonel. À bientôt. Au revoir. Every Friday, here on the parade ground in Aubain, there's a ceremony for the handful of men who are leaving. This is the ceremony of liberation, freedom. And at the end, what have they got? An experience, certainly unforgettable. They get their passport back if they happen to arrive with one. And they get this certificate, if they behave themselves, of good conduct, saying they've served with honor and fidelity. I remember standing here on this parade ground 20 years ago. Mixed feelings, relief that it was all over, one had come through, and quite a lot of sadness, too. And is it all worth it? For some, yes. Others, I don't know, you'll have to ask them. For me, no regrets. No. Hey!